On May 11th, 2016, Max Scherzer took the mound against the Tigers for the first time since they let him walk after the 2014 season. He matched up against Jordan Zimmerman, the longtime national who the Tigers signed to replace Max, at a much cheaper rate of course. This was Scherzer's chance to show the Tigers front office what they missed out on by cheaping out, and Max was mad. Again, and a swing and a miss. Fastball blows him away. Strikes out his third man. It's another strikeout. Oh, a full third strike. Max Scherzer, another strikeout. Maybe the best ever, but that's not fair. <laughs> wow. Got him looking. Swing and a miss. Number 15. Against a declining but still very strong lineup, Scherzer struck out 15 batters through the first seven innings of work, giving him a slim chance to do what no man had done before him. The high water mark for strikeouts in a nine inning game was 20, and only three players had ever completed the feat. But beyond that, the climb to 20 was over a century in the making. And this video is about all of the men that built this record into the rarest single game pitching accomplishment. After all, every single starter of every single nine inning game ever played has had a chance at 20 strikeouts. And we probably won't ever see it happen again, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. Against Jose Iglesias in the top of the eighth, and with some help from home plate umpire Bill Miller, Scherzer tied baseball's original record. Got him! Number 16. Even from the early days, fans, players, and reporters all understood the difference between a strikeout and an out in play. A strikeout is pure dominance by the pitcher. The hitter either whiffed, tipped the ball into the catcher's glove, or was frozen by a called strike. Even if the end result is the same as a pop out or basis empty ground out, there's always been a pride in putting the ball in play. After all, Putting the ball in play, regardless of how well, still gives the batter at least a slim chance to reach base. Pitchers who do rack up strikeouts display a total control over a game that is typically relying on all 18 individual players on the field. I'll only be considering games since 1901, because of more reliable record keeping, and only 9 inning games so it's only pitchers who had 27 outs to work with. And on May 22, 1901, it took Cincinnati Reds ace Noodles Han just 9 innings to strike out 16 Boston Bean Eaters. I'm gonna take a guess that literally zero of you watching right now have ever heard of this game, but it's easily one of the most impressive games ever pitched. The Bean Eaters struck out less than 10% of the time in 1901. For reference, only two qualified batters out of the 130 total in 2022 struck out at a lower rate, and Noodles only struck out six batters per nine on the year. So that's like if Cal Quantrill struck out a lineup of nine Stephen Quants and Jeff McNeils 16 times in a single game. Noodles Han is our baseline for excellence for strikeouts in a game. I'm glad all of you now know that this game happened. Han's single game 9 inning record was matched but never exceeded for the next 32 years and change. Small ball ruled the league in the early 1900s. In the 20s, Babe Ruth brought hitting into the modern era with his power, but it took an even more special talent to revolutionize the game from the mound. Scherzer delivered a first pitch ball to Jared Saltalamacchia for his 100th pitch of the game, but he wasn't tired. That ball was merely a courtesy. A red hot fastball sandwiched between two ice cold changeups froze the veteran catcher and sat him down in the blink of an eye. Change up right in there, 17. The strikeout resurgence began with Cardinals flamethrowing righty Dizzy Dean. Dizzy was the ace of the Cardinals team known as the Gas House Gang, consisting of himself, his brother Daffy Dean, and future Hall of Famers Dazzy Vance and Ducky Medwick. Yeah, I'm dead serious. Dizzy's rookie year was 1932, and he led the NL in strikeouts, innings pitched, and shutouts. His entry onto this list came in July of 1933, when he struck out 17 of the 36 Cubs he faced, all while going 3 for 4 with two doubles and no strikeouts of his own. Cubs leadoff hitter Mike Koenig struck out just 9 times all season, and two of those were at the hands of Dean in this game. Dean went on to win 30 starts and a World Series the next year, made the Hall of Fame, and became a legendary broadcaster, but this record of his was largely forgotten. After all, it didn't even make it through the decade. 
With his 17th strikeout, Scherzer tied his own Nationals record and still had four more outs to work with. His next challenge was Ian Kinsler, Detroit's power-hitting second baseman who was in the midst of his last great season. Pitching backwards, Max sat him down in about 35 seconds. Another one! 18 down, three more to go. Our next pitcher grew up in a farmer's town with less than 500 residents. Ted Williams called him the best pitcher he ever faced in his career, and Stan Musial said he was the greatest pitcher of the generation. He was the best pitcher on the face of the earth before graduating high school, and he was probably the first man to throw 100 miles per hour. He is the earliest pitcher who I'm confident would have been a star if he played in the modern game, and he revolutionized how pitchers pitched. His name was Bob Feller. Feller signed with Cleveland for $1 and went straight from high school to the majors, never throwing a single pitch in the minor leagues. And in his first big league start ever, Feller struck out 15 batters. You know how the first few minutes of this video were all about how it took 33 years for the first modern 17 strikeout game? Feller matched that in his fifth career start at just 17 years of age. Feller's fastball wasn't just straight heat like most pitchers of the time. The way it was described by scouts made it seem more like a sinker, and at near 100 miles per hour, those hitters had no idea how to hit it, but he truly marked his name into the record books on the last day of the 1938 season. Cleveland lost the game 4-1 and Feller walked 7 batters, but he struck out 18 Tigers, including Hank Greenberg twice and Chet Lobbs 5 times. Nobody matched Bob for over two decades, and nobody passed him for over three. The only two who did tie it were Sandy Koufax, who may be the greatest ever and did it twice, and Don Wilson, who did it during the legendary year of the pitcher. But the late 60s and 70s brought about a new crop of flamethrowers. Hold on, this video is sponsored by DraftKings. The baseball season is in full swing and DraftKings Sportsbook is offering all new customers $150 in bonus bets if their $5 pregame Moneyline wager cashes. That's right, new customers bet just $5 on any pregame Moneyline wager and receive $150 in bonus bets if their bet hits. You can use those bonus bets on same game parlays, team futures, awards, and pretty much anything else you can think of. If sports betting isn't available in your state, don't worry, you can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they offer cash prizes for nearly every sport. New customers, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use promo code That's Baseball to let them know I sent you, bet $5 on any pregame Moneyline wager, and get $150 in bonus bets if your bet hits. That's promo code That's Baseball, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. But most importantly, please know your limits and gamble responsibly. J.D. Martinez was emerging as the Robin and Miggy's Batman in 2016, and he was Scherzer's first assignment of the ninth after nearly 25 minutes in the dugout. As he'd been doing in recent innings, Scherzer started him off with a first pitch slider. That ball has hit a ton out to left center. J.D. Martinez makes this a 3-2 game. Now clinging on to a one-run lead, most managers would probably go to their closer. Scherzer was on his fourth time through the order and approaching 110 pitches. After hanging that slider, it wouldn't have been unreasonable to pull the plug, especially with Miguel Cabrera set to hit next. But this was Dusty Baker's Nationals. He did not even flinch. And Max was done fooling around with that first pitch slider bullshit. He was back to the heat. Swing! Pitch 111 was 97 miles per hour, right past one of the best hitters of the generation. Max still had plenty of gas in the tank, and the entire stadium knew just how close he was coming to history. In the aforementioned year of the pitcher, Cardinals ace Bob Gibson pitched the single greatest season ever, and he wrapped it up by throwing one of the greatest World Series starts ever. Bob made Game 1 of the 1968 World Series his magnum opus, a complete game shutout allowing just 6 base runners while striking out 17 Tigers. It's still the postseason record for strikeouts in a game, with Kevin Brown being the only other pitcher to even reach 16. Bob Gibson was the best pitcher on the planet, undisputed, but what baseball fans didn't realize is that the man who who would usurp the title was already in the Cardinals rotation.
With the Phillies, Steve Carlton won four Cy Young Awards, became a slam dunk first ballot Hall of Famer, and pitched what is maybe the second greatest season ever behind Gibson's 68, but his entry on this list came while he was still in St. Louis. A month before they won the World Series, the Mets lineup struck out 19 times against Carlton, but they were known as the Miracle Mets for a reason, and they actually won the game. We didn't see our first 19 strikeout game until year 69 of what I'm calling the modern era, and it happened the year after the field of play was changed to help out batters. But the second 19 strikeout game happened in the first month of the very next year. Mets ace Tom Seaver watched from the dugout as Carlton made history against his team, and it must have inspired him to try it out for himself. On April 22nd, 1970, he struck out 19 Padres and held them to one run. He also struck out the last 10 batters he faced, setting a single game consecutive strikeout record that still stands to this day. The third 19 strikeout game in five years was thrown by someone who was also in the dugout for each of the previous two. Nolan Ryan was a Met, as old Mets fans won't let you forget. He was there when Carlton struck out 19 Mets, and he was there when Seaver struck out 19 Padres. Ryan ascended after being traded to the Angels, and it culminated in the first 19 strikeout game against the lineup with a DH. The Ryan Express actually totaled four different 19 strikeout games in his career, with three of those being extra inning starts, but he could still never break the 20 strikeout barrier. With one out in the ninth, Vimar knocked a base hit down the left field line, bringing the go-ahead run up to the plate. Justin Upton hadn't been great in his first few weeks as a Tiger, but he was still a feared bat. With an 0-1 count, Upton popped the pitch foul to the right side, and it just barely fell out of first baseman Ryan Zimmerman's reach. You're rooting for the ball to go in the stand, so he has a chance to strike out another hitter. The home crowd cheered for the prospect of another strikeout. Scherzer had Upton right where he wanted him. Swing and a miss! 20 strikeouts for Max Scherzer! There it is. Max Scherzer joined the stratospheric air only occupied by three others in the 20 strikeout club. But he had one more out to work with, and thus one more chance to rise above the rest and stand alone. If you've enjoyed this video so far, please subscribe. Over 90% of my viewers aren't subscribed, and it'll help me make more of these types of videos in the future if you do. Thanks. The first 20 strikeout game was the only other time a pitcher had a shot at 21. On April 29th, 1986, Roger Clemens had struck out 16 Mariners with two outs in the seventh. He got ahead of Gorman Thomas 1-2, and, and the Fenway Park crowd rose to their feet. But Thomas hit the ultimate silencer, a go-ahead solo shot to dead center. Clemens then got Jim Presley down 0-2 before he poked the dribbler to first for the final out. Luckily, Dwight Evans picked up his ace in the bottom half. With a new two-run cushion, Clemens was able to focus up and get back into cruise control, with the sole focus of getting to 20. And in the top of the ninth, he froze Phil Bradley for the record. Clemens has set a major league record for strikeouts in a game. 20. He had a chance at 21, but Ken Phelps put a weak grounder in play to close the book on one of the greatest games ever pitched. My baseball people love Ken Phelps bat. They kept saying, Ken Phelps, Ken Phelps. All in all, Clemens faced 30 batters, just three over the minimum, and struck out two thirds of them. He got 25 batters out of 30 into two strike counts, didn't walk a single batter, and only allowed three hits. It was a game for the ages, and nobody matched it for a decade. But in September of 1996, a veteran right for the Red Sox put on an eerily similar performance. His name is Roger Clemens. Clemens was a fireballer throughout his entire career, but his 1986 was maybe his best season. At 33 years old, he wasn't quite as dominant, and he was nearing the end of his 13-year tenure in Boston. In what ended up being his final win as a Sox, he turned back the clock and gave the baseball world a taste of the decade of dominance he still had left in his right arm. The Tigers that he faced were a feeble team. There's no other way to put it, but Clemens allowed just 5 singles, no runs, and no walks. He had 19 strikeouts entering the ninth this time, a better pace, but he was definitely gassed. Don't get me wrong, he was still throwing absolute gas, but his location was starting to falter, and the Tigers' batters were battling. They started off the inning with a pop-out, single, and deep fly-out to left eliminating any chance at a 21 or 22 strikeout game. But when it came down to his last chance, he still had one more masterful pitch in his back pocket. He got him! He ties his own record from April 1986 on September 1996. 
Roger Clemens does it again. The 23-year-old Clemens looked like he had another six or seven innings left in that arm when he broke the record. In contrast, this version of Clemens looked relieved just to be done with the thing. In the first 96 modern baseball seasons and 31 seasons prior, only one man reached the 20 strikeout summit. Roger Clemens did what no man had done before, despite thousands and thousands of attempts. And now, he'd done it twice. The one extra inning exception that I have to talk about here is Randy Johnson's 20 strikeout performance against the Reds in 2001. He pitched 9 innings, allowed just 3 singles, walked nobody, and made the Reds look silly almost all night. The problem is that his offense only scored him one run, and the game was tied after the ninth. Johnson was pulled for future World Series star Byung Hyung Kim, and although he struck out 20 batters in 9 innings, it wasn't a complete game performance. It's still one of the greatest games ever pitched, and I encourage you to go back through and watch all those highlights because my lord he was on that night. But it's the only 20 strikeout game where the pitcher didn't pick up the win. Game score is a stat devised by Bill James to measure starting pitching performances. Each starter begins with 50 points, adding a point for every out recorded and an extra bonus for strikeouts, adding 2 points for each inning completed after the 4th, and subtracting a point per walk, 2 points per hit or unearned run, and 4 points per earned run. Anything above 70 is a great start. Most excellent and memorable starts fall above 80. Scores in the 90s are classified by fangraphs as make sure your friends are watching games. It takes a historically special start to reach 100. Of all the great games I've discussed so far, Clemens has come the closest to the mark, as well as Johnson who also scored a 97. But our next entry on this list didn't only crack 100, it is considered by the stat to be the single greatest ball game ever pitched. Kerry Wood was drafted 4th overall by the Cubs in 1995. He competed for a roster spot in spring of 98. When he was demoted, Cubs fans anticipated seeing him sometime in the summer, but after just one dominant AAA start, Wood got the call for good. His first four starts as a Cub were a mixed bag. After struggling in his debut, he picked up a victory in his first Wrigley Field start, but his third start was a complete and utter disaster. He allowed seven runs, didn't get out of the second inning, and almost sparked a brawl by hitting Raul Mondesi. He was so bad that reporters immediately anticipated a demotion back to AAA to work on his command, but the Cubs held strong in a trial-by-fire approach. In contrast, his fourth start was fantastic, going seven innings of one-run ball and striking out 9 Cardinals. As these things usually go, nobody anticipated it, but his 5th start turned a random Wednesday day game at Wrigley to one of the most iconic games in Cubs history. His opponent was the Houston Astros, the highest scoring offense in the National League and a team that went on to win 102 regular season games in 1998. This lineup is by far the most talented of the opposing lineups we've talked about today. Wood took the Wrigley mound and his first assignment was future Hall of Famer Craig Biggio, and his first pitch didn't inspire confidence. That is some heat, folks. Sandy wow. just misses it. But after falling behind 2 0, Wood went back to the heat three times in a row for a quick first punch out. Got him with the heat. Up stepped Derek Bell who was leading the National League with a 403 average at the time and finished the year with an OPS plus of 125. With some help from home plate ump Jerry Meals, he jumped ahead 0-2, before breaking off a ridiculous curve to send Bell back to the bench. Bell strikes out. Oh my goodness. But it only got harder from there. The Astros 3 hitter was another future Hall of Famer in Jeff Bagwell, who walked 19 more times than he struck out on the season. He was one of the scariest hitters in the National League, but Wood had no problem with it. He punched out the order in the first. Astro starter Shane Reynolds also struck out the side in the bottom half, so Wood was back on the mound right away and he kept the rhythm going, blowing some high cheddar by cleanup hitter Jack Howell. Moises Alou was next, and he might have been the best hitter on the team that year, even better than the two Hall of Famers. Wood had his best slider working, and he was getting it called right off the plate, so Alou had no chance. Dave Clark was the first batter of the game to put the ball in play, hitting a lazy fly out to center and ending the inning. To start off the top of the third, Wood got ahead of shortstop Ricky Gutierrez 0-2, but Gutierrez battled, fighting off a low curve foul before rolling over another curve right the third for an easy out. Oh, oh. Well, after that error, wait, they're giving him a hit? 
I'm sorry, this is an error at every level of baseball. Little League, high school, college, and pro. If I'm recording the book as a Little League coach, that's going down as an error. You're not gonna hit that easy, kid. And another thing, the Cubs were at home. This is the home score that does every Cubs game. I don't know what he was thinking. This ended up being the only Astro hit of the game, and Wood did not let it deter him. He struck out Brad Osmus next, struck out Bagwell and Howell in the fourth, and struck out the side in the fifth, all looking. After a strikeout of the opposing pitcher, he hit BGO in the 6th. It would be the last base runner he'd allow. He struck out the side again in the 7th, then again in the 8th. What can you say? Then struck out a pinch hitting Bill Spears to start the ninth. Got him! He ties the National League record! He was at 19, but Biggio continued to be a thorn in his side, grounding out the shortstop to eliminate any chance of 21. But Derek Bell was no match for his sweeper, and Wood, at just 20 years old, cemented his name in baseball history. Got him! 20 strikeouts! He ties the Major League record! Before he was able to legally buy alcohol, Wood did something so endearing for Cubs fans that he would never have to buy his own drink in the city of Chicago again. His game score for the game was 105, the highest in big league history. I consider this game much more dominant than most no-hitters, and even most perfect games. Cubs fans were forever grateful. Even though injuries prevented him from fulfilling his Hall of Fame potential, Kerry Wood is still a hero on the north side of Chicago all thanks to one spectacular start. 14 years to the month later, Wood made his last appearance in the bigs, finishing out his second stint in Chicago as a reliever. The standing ovation at Wrigley Field that day was an extension of the one he got when he was just a kid, making history all of those years ago. And this is how he wanted to go out. He wanted to go out with one more appearance and go out his way. Kerry came ashore an already very lonely island, joining only Clemens and then later Johnson and Scherzer. And with the way the game has shifted towards bullpen usage, Max may be the last member of the 20 strikeout club. But there's still one more question. Could Mad Max get 21? He had one more out to go to get one more punch out, and the only man standing in his way of a formerly unimaginable 21 strikeout game stepped up to the plate. Third base side, Rendon to second. It was James McCann. James McCann can't do anything at all. He is quite feeble. He might be terrible. 